Welcome. The purpose of this short tutorial is to provide a high-level and largely non-technical overview of offline reinforcement learning. Offline reinforcement learning is a way that we can think about learning decision-making strategies directly from data without any online interaction. So before I get into the details of what offline reinforcement learning is, um, let me motivate this a little bit by discussing more broadly what makes modern machine learning methods work so well. Of course, uh, you've probably heard about many successes of machine learning in domains from computer vision to natural language processing to speech recognition and so forth. At the core of many of the successes of machine learning methods that you've probably heard about are two basic ingredients. Large data sets that are broadly uh, representative of the real situation that the model is meant to handle, and very large and high capacity deep neural network models that can squeeze out all the knowledge contained in that data set and make accurate predictions on new unseen inputs. And this basic formula, plus a lot of research and engineering, has been at the core of major breakthroughs in computer vision, natural language processing, speech recognition, and many other domains. The size of these neural network models matters a lot for their success. The basic uh, ingredients behind deep learning have been around for decades, uh, but the, the actual size of the models has increased substantially, with the latest models in computer vision, for example, having hundreds of layers, uh, you know, orders of magnitude more uh, than models even 10 years ago. And the performance of these models suggests that the larger they are, the better they work to the point where, for example, on the ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenge, current deep networks can attain better results even than humans with error rates uh, at you know, less than uh, 5%, and the error rates seem to decrease further and further as these networks get bigger, as they get more layers. So in this graph, as you move to the right, it's showing more recent models. The uh, triangles show the number of layers, and the bars show the error rates. So you can see as the uh, number of layers increases, the error rate seems to decrease. But it's not just all about models. In some ways, the um, structure of how machine learning research is published promotes uh, making a big deal out of model size and under, uh, underscoring the, or underestimating the importance of data sets. Because typically machine learning research is valued on standardized data sets. But a lot of the progress in reality has also been accompanied by a tremendous growth in the size of data sets. You know, older uh, data sets like MNIST uh, had training sets of tens of thousands of images. Uh, more recent uh, data sets, you know, even as recently as 2009, were still in the high tens of thousands, whereas data sets like ImageNet, uh, which have been the basis for a lot of the really impressive results in image recognition, have millions of training images. In natural language processing, we've seen the same trend, uh, that uh, the really good results are obtained by training on enormous data sets, data sets of hundreds or thousands of millions of natural language sentences. So from this, we could deduce that if we want machine learning systems to work really well, we should use large models, but we should train those large models on very, very large data sets. And that means that we need methods that can accommodate large data sets. But of course, in reality, we don't just want our models to make predictions. We don't just want them to predict the category of an object in an image or when something will happen. We want to use the models to actually make decisions. And ultimately, if they're making predictions, those predictions are probably in service to some kind of decision that we will make. So uh, besides just recognizing things in images or translating text, uh, where we have data that is distributed independently, meaning that each data point is independent of every other data point, we have ground truth supervision, we know exactly what the right output is for every training example, and the objective is merely to predict the right label, what we might want instead is to solve decision-making problems. Problems like driving autonomous vehicles, controlling robots, but also problems in inventory management. How do you decide the right level of inventory to maximize revenue? How do you decide how to appropriately trade stocks uh, to maximize profit? Or in medicine, how do you decide what kind of medication or test to order for a patient in order to get their condition to improve? These are all decision-making problems rather than prediction problems. The goal in inventory management is not just to predict what your profit will be, it is actually to maximize that profit. So you have some utility measure and you want that utility measure to go up and any prediction you make is merely in service to that end goal. Unfortunately, decision-making problems are quite a bit more complex than prediction problems because each decision you make 
can influence future inputs, which means your inputs are no longer independent of each other. So a model trained to recognize objects in an image thinks that the label it produces for the first image is not going to alter anything about the second image. But if that model is actually driving an autonomous car, the steering command it produces in response to the current camera observation will affect what the next camera observation is. If it makes a mistake now, maybe it swerves the car at the next frame, it will be in a worse situation. Similarly, if you're doing inventory management, uh, financial transactions, or prescribing medications, the decisions you make have effects on the future, and those effects are, could be much more important than the fidelity of the decision that you make right now. So you need to make the decision now that doesn't just maximize current accuracy, but results in the long-term consequences that you want. And this is much harder and it's mathematically much more complex. Supervision for decision-making problems is often much more high level. We might not know exactly which actions lead to the largest profit for our inventory management problem. Instead, we might have a high-level goal like maximize profit, get the car to reach the destination, or cure the patient. And our objective ultimately is not to achieve a desired level of accuracy, but is to accomplish a desired task. The way that we can mathematically think about these kinds of problems in machine learning is through the framework of reinforcement learning, and that's what we'll talk about next. But before we do that, I just want to emphasize that these are not just issues for control, right? So the examples that I give are very much control-centric applications, but in many cases, real-world deployment of any machine learning model, even if it is actually a prediction model, has these same feedback issues. We assume when we train our model that its decisions will be independent, but in reality, when we actually use it to do something in the world, it affects how the world behaves, and the model, if it's unaware of this, might not perform as well at deployment time as it seems to perform uh, when we develop it. So as an example, if you train a predictive model uh, to model uh, how traffic will, will behave, and then you uh, deploy it and uh, people actually use it to decide on their driving habits, well, it'll change their driving habits, and traffic might not behave the same way that your model thinks it should. So this feedback is tremendously important, even if you're just deploying prediction models. So reinforcement learning is conventionally the framework that we use to think about learning-based control. At deployment time, a reinforcement learning agent chooses actions to interact with the world, and the world responds with some resulting state, and also a feedback signal, which we call a reward function, that indicates uh, how well the agent did at that point in time. So this could be, for example, the profit uh, that, that you achieved. The goal of the agent is to select those actions that don't just maximize the reward right now, but over all time. So if you're adjusting inventory levels, you don't just make a decision about what to purchase uh, for your warehouse uh, based on what will make you the most money today, but what will make you the most money in the long run. And this is the biggest challenge in reinforcement learning, the fact that your rewards might be delayed from the decision that actually led to those rewards. At training time, reinforcement learning is conventionally viewed as an active and online process, where an agent interacts with the world, uh, collects some experience, uses that experience to modify its behavior, which we call policy, and then collects some more experience. And this is done many, many times. The analogy that is often used is learning through trial and error. Uh, much as how you would train a dog by giving it a treat or some punishment, if it does something you want or don't want, a reinforcement learning agent learns through its own mistakes uh, conventionally. This is the textbook vision of reinforcement learning. But this is fundamentally an active and online process. And it can be very difficult to shoehorn this process into solving the kind of decision-making problems that we actually care about. If you want an autonomous car to drive through reinforcement learning, the conventional recipe would be to allow the car to make mistakes to actually crash into things and learn from that experience, which is, of course, ridiculous. Similarly, for inventory management, you might not want to let your reinforcement learning agent make costly mistakes before it learns how to manage inventory levels. Same for finance, and certainly for medicine, you don't just want to pres prescribe random drugs to patients to see what works until your policy has had enough time to learn this. Compounding these issues is the fact that these reinforcement learning algorithms, like any deep learning algorithm, require a large amount of data to learn effectively. But in the online setting, this translates to a large amount of active interaction, which means a large number of mistakes. So for this reason, naive use of reinforcement learning algorithms in the real world has been limited because this kind of online training process is extremely costly and unwieldy in many cases. So does online reinforcement learning actually work? Well, the answer is yes, but only if online interaction is feasible and plentiful. Uh, this is the case, for example, if you're playing Atari games in an emulator, if you're playing the game of Go, where the rules are known and fixed and you can simulate as many Go games as you want. 
if you're training robotic systems in simulation. But you can also do reinforcement learning in the real world if you, for example, you have robotic systems where it's okay to let them uh, try and fail and try and try again. And uh, this has been deployed to great effect, for example, uh, in some work that we've done from Google uh, in 2018. We managed to get state-of-the-art results for robotic grasping using online reinforcement learning, but in a setup where robots could try the task repeatedly. So how can we get these kinds of reinforcement learning algorithms to, to work in the real world? What have people tried to do before? Well, in domains where direct online interaction is difficult, basically there are two choices. One is to actually run the learned policies in the real world, collect data, train, and iterate, usually with some kind of mechanism to ensure safety, uh, with some additional checks and uh, verification added in. This is seemingly closest to how humans learn, which is quite nice, but it can be very difficult to set up. The systems that we have to put in place to make online data collection RL feasible are costly, expensive, and they often make the task deviate a little bit from its real-world counterpart. And it could be prohibitively costly if the policy is bad. So if you deploy a bad untrained policy for autonomous driving, you might actually crash a few cars before you learn something, and that's often a, a big barrier. An alternative that has been widely explored in the literature is to build a simulator and train your policy in simulation. This is very appealing because it's very safe, and you can test your policy in simulation before you deploy it. But the big downside is that someone has to actually build the simulator which means that ultimately the biggest challenge with this approach is getting the simulator to reflect reality well enough so that the policies you train in the simulator actually work in the real world. This is more like human learning than machine learning, and the challenge of this is compounded by the fact that these online reinforcement learning algorithms, if given enough time, can work extremely well. But that means that if your simulator has some flaw, the algorithm will likely learn to exploit that flaw. For instance, if you're simulating a financial trading application, and uh, there is uh, some exploitable quirk in how the market is simulated in your simulator, the algorithm may make tremendous profits by exploiting that quirk, which would never work in the real world. And this is a huge problem with simulated training of RL algorithms. But ultimately, there's also a little bit of a philosophical question here. If simulated training worked so well, why isn't this what we use for vision, NLP, and speech recognition, uh, these prediction problems, where across the board, the biggest successes are obtained by using real data? So the idea behind offline reinforcement learning is that if learning from data works so well, can we just modify RL so that it learns from data? So basically, can we apply the same recipe to reinforcement learning that has been so successful in prediction? Large data sets and large models without online interaction. So in regular reinforcement learning, you have a policy that interacts with the world, updates, and then interacts with the world some more. In offline reinforcement learning, the idea is that we take a data set that has already been collected by some other policy, denoted as pi beta in this picture, and then we use that data set without any additional active interaction to get the best policy we can from that data set. And then we deploy that policy. Of course, in a realistic use of offline RL, we might still collect additional data from that deployment to improve the policy further, but the primary goal of offline RL algorithms is to get that initial policy trained from prior data without any online interaction to be as effective as it can be. So the workflow for an offline reinforcement learning method might look like this. Step one, collect a data set however you want, using any policy or mixture of policies. Um, so this could involve, for example, asking humans to perform the task, using some existing system to perform the task. For instance, maybe you have an existing autonomous system that is not learning-based but works decently well. You can use that to collect data. You could even take entirely random behaviors if that's safe to do in your domain or any combination of the above. So essentially for step one, you have a lot of freedom in how you collect your data, much like if you're collecting a data set of images for a supervised learning application, you would use a variety of strategies to collect those images as long as you get images that are representative of your task. So here the criteria is the same. Use any strategy to collect your data so long as it's, it covers the range of situations that you might encounter in your task. And this is only done once. Of course, you could add to that data set later if you want, but the assumptions of the offline reinforcement learning process do not require you to do this more than once. Then step two is to run an offline reinforcement learning algorithm on this data set, and intuitively what this algorithm will do is it will squeeze the best behavior it can out of that data. So you can think of it, this as the best policy we can get based on what the data tells us. Now, a policy is just a mapping from states to actions. It's basically a behavioral strategy. So once we've learned this behavioral strategy, we can deploy it in the real world, and hopefully it'll perform better than the existing uh, mechanism that you have, or maybe better than the best human that collected the data. 
And if you're not happy with how it performs, you can go back and modify the algorithm and run step two again, reusing the same data that you had before. The end goal in offline reinforcement learning is to get a better policy than the one that collected your data. So if you have maybe uh, 10 humans trying to perform the task, you might hope to uh, extract a policy that sort of takes the best parts of all of them, the best the, takes the best decisions and discards the worst decisions. Um, so for instance, in inventory management, you could take a data set of uh, uh, logs of uh, inventory levels and resulting profits that you had in the past, that's your data set from step one. You run your offline RL algorithm, it proposes a new strategy for adjusting inventory levels, and then you deploy it in the real world, and hopefully it'll perform better. Okay, so what is hard about offline RL? Why can't we just go and do this? Well, the fundamental problem in offline RL is counterfactual queries. It's a what if question. Here's an example to illustrate this. Let's say in your training data, you observe cars driving, and they always drive straight along roads. They never swerve and go off the road. Now, the policy would ask, what would happen if I were to swerve off the road? Now, in reality, a bad thing would happen, so you would hope the policy does not choose to do this. This is an example of a counterfactual query. The policy is trying to figure out what would happen if it were to do something other than what was done in the data. Now, fundamentally, if you want to improve the behavior in the data, you have to answer these counterfactual queries. But some counterfactual queries cannot be answered effectively using the data available to you. If you've never seen a car swerve on the road, you can't know whether it's good or bad. How do you know if you didn't see it in the data? So this is the basic challenge in offline reinforcement learning. You have to resolve counterfactual queries, but you also have to be aware of which of those questions cannot be answered with the data available to you. Online RL algorithms don't have to deal with this because they can simply try this action and see what happens. They would actually attempt to run the car off the road, learn that it's bad, and then stop doing it. But an offline RL algorithm has to somehow account for these unseen actions, we call them out of distribution actions, ideally in a safe way, while still making use of generalization to come up with behaviors that are better than the best thing seen in the data. How do they do this? Well, at a very high level, there are three broad strategies. One strategy is what we call policy constraints, limit how much the learned behavior deviates from the behavior in the data. This is a relatively simple approach to understand and analyze, but it can be too limiting. Uh, it might constrain the learned behavior too much, it might not improve enough over the data, and it requires actually estimating the policy that generated the data, which we might not know. The data might have been generated by a person, we might not know what that person's strategy actually was. Another approach uh, is what we call conservative algorithms. Assume that anything that is too different from the observed actions is bad, but still permit things that are only a little different. This directly enforces this kind of notion of safe behavior. If you've really never seen this before, assume it's bad. But it could be too conservative, because sometimes the model might actually guess correctly what would happen on an unseen action, but we still wouldn't trust it. Another class of approaches utilize uncertainty estimation. They attempt to explicitly estimate how certain or uncertain we are about each possible action. Conceptually, this is very appealing, uh, but effective uncertainty estimation is extremely difficult, and these methods actually don't tend to perform all that well in practice. All right, so if you want to learn more about offline reinforcement learning, a few res resources I might recommend. Uh, there's a tutorial article that I wrote together with a few of my colleagues called Offline, Offline Reinforcement Learning Tutorial Review and Perspectives on Open Problems. It's intended for a machine learning audience, but accessible without prior RL background. Uh, there is a, a NURBS tutorial uh, that my student Avral Kumar and I did uh, in 2020. It's intended for a machine learning audience with some RL background. Uh, it has some code examples as well to work through. And then if you want uh, an introduction to RL more generally, not just offline RL specifically, there's a course that I teach at UC Berkeley on reinforcement learning where all the materials are available online.